many of you know this week has been the 50th anniversary for the Black Panther Party for self-defense and a lot of us have been activating and doing a lot of good work this week and uh, I thought it'd be cool to have a few of them address us on some of the ways in which uh, you know the works of justice that they're doing across the country uh, are, are actually bearing themselves out and and um, it won't be that long because uh, one of them is also going to perform and rap for us today uh, and uh, so I'm excited to have that happen so uh, the first person y'all know he is uh, one of the He's actually the first person we baptized here at the way back, all the way back in 2005. Dr. Antonio Sediel is in the house, so we're going to invite him to come on up and uh, get up here on the stage. Uh, one of the, the great homies, uh, she leads the Chicago Peace Movement. Her name is Jessica DeSue, but she is known as FM Supreme, so she's going to come on up here. And uh, many of y'all may remember him. He came and preached here a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, his name was Phil Agnew. Since then, he's changed his name to Umi Sela. So I'm going to invite Umi to come on up and uh, get on the stage and, and uh, spend a few minutes here. And uh, just ha let's just have a pretty cool conversation. Let's make sure y'all have some mics here. All right, so uh, we we all been here all week, and uh, <laughs> and uh, it's it's been it's been a great blessing. Um, I love for for you all maybe just share a little bit about who you guys are, where you're from, and what's some of the work that you're doing right now. Go ahead, Umi, you can start off. Hey, good morning, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I, I lost my voice a little bit actually last time that I was here a few days ago, uh, but my name is Umi. I, I did change my name. I serve as a co-director of a group called the Dream Defenders out of Florida, and it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be able to fellowship with Pastor Mike and the congregation today. Um, we're, we're doing work to end the end youth arrest by 2022 in mm. the state of Florida. Um, <laughs> so, so in the state of Florida, 100% of our, our youth incarceration system is private. So every rehab facility, every detention center, every residential facility is all a for-profit venture. We arrest more children out of uh, school than any other state in the country. And Florida has made it its business to ensure that Disney World is the only place where dreams come true for children. And so we, we're doing a lot of work. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take six years or so for us to get there, but that's a little bit of the work that we're focused on right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and... and uh Later, Bob. I'll come back. Uh, uh, FM Supreme, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, where you're from. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Um, my name is Jessica Disu. I'm also known as FM Supreme, born and raised in Chicago. Uh, I'm a youth organizer with Chicago International Youth Peace Movement. Uh, since 2012, we've created programs, uh, youth leadership development programs, partnered with different community organizations across the city um, to learn different ways to cultivate a culture of peace in our communities. Uh, we believe that no one is coming to save us, that we must save ourselves, and that we must be the change we wish to see. And so what does peace look like when there is no justice in the streets? And so uh, I've been blessed to do programs in the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center. Um, I'm, my work is primarily based on the west side of Chicago at Holy Family Ministries. And I am here by the way of Trinity United Church of Christ with Pastor Otis Moss III and Pastor Jeremiah Wright, who's our pastor emeritus. Yeah, yeah. Clap it up for that. Clap it up for that. And then Brother Antonio. And I see Rahel. Come on up here, Rahel. You got to come sit on here and, and talk. Go ahead. So I'm Antonio. I grew up about a mile from here. Uh, former teacher. I was a principal at Emory High School. Uh, Deputy Superintendent in the Boston Public Schools. Been working with Mike on the Live Free campaign for the last few years. It went back into school district work until uh, Mike called me from a uh, Ferguson jail. <laughs> I said, maybe it's time to get back into this work. So uh, lately we've been rolling with Mike again. So that's what I'm doing. All right. Thank you. Clap it up. And Rahel, introduce yourself. Uh... Hi, my name is Rahel. That's from Merriam. And I'm a believer, I'm a freedom fighter, I'm a writer, um, I'm blessed to be mentored by the wonderful Pastor Mike. I run an online, who did that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was you. <laughs> Y'all <Y> so rude. <laughs> okay. mentors, ain't, mentors ain't what they used to be, I know. <laughs> Uh, but I run an online magazine called Urban Cuss that I use as a movement tool, uh, former Washington Post columnist. I started a, 
uh, economic boycott a couple of years ago you may have heard of called Not One Dime. And um, hopefully you still won't be shopping on Black Friday. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's start with you. You are from the Bay Area. We both have a lot of love for the Black Panther Party. Um, and there's so many misconceptions about the Black Panther Party. We were talking with Elaine Brown and some of the elders about how the Black Panther Party was not a black nationalist party. They actually were organizing with uh, poor whites from Appalachia, uh, Latino and, and uh, uh, Chicanos from Chicago. I even met some Polynesian Black Panthers that were in town this week. Uh, talk a little bit about why the Black Panther Party uh, for us is such an important uh, thing for us to be mindful of in this season, in this moment, particularly given you know, our church, you helped actually create the culture of justice and ministry at our church. Why do you think folks here need to be mindful of these kinds of examples? Well, Mike and I had a great opportunity a few weeks ago. We sat down for like four, four hours with Elaine Brown. The, the blessing about her is she loves to talk and share her experiences. And one of the things that, that I got from her, her stories and her conversation was it's critical in a movement to have a clear ideology, right? You can't just protest and say no. The question is, if you're doing revolution, what are you going to substitute the old regime with, right? You need to have an ideology that's clear. Okay, and so the blessing about being in church is we have some guidance on that, mm. right? We're not searching far and wide for some ideology. We have a nice book <laughs> that lays out some of this for us. And so as we were talking to, to Elaine Brown, uh, what occurred to me is what connects us to the Panthers, regardless if you agree with all their tactics and every specific thing they did, was a commitment to ending exploitation. Right? So if you take seriously in the Bible that we are meant to liberate the oppressed, right, you need to be as committed as the Panthers were. Right? So we talk about the great sacrifices they made. They went to jail. They were killed, ostracized. What are we willing to do as the church? Okay? So to me, that's the direct relevance that the church as a whole needs to take more seriously. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Umi, jump, jump in here because uh, your Dream Defenders has actually helped to do some of, some of the more cutting edge uh, work in the last four or five years around this. And, and I'd love for you to maybe just reflect on um, not only the Panthers, but what drives you all. And, and if you could uh, give a, a, a projection of what you hope yeah. this country looks like for the future of all people. What, what would that look like? Because I, I know we, yeah. we, we always deconstructing, but what would we want to be constructing in your work? And right. um, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, we've got to, we, we want to build, right now we're focused on Florida. We think Florida is bad enough if we can do some amazing work <laughs> in Florida, it would shift the country. Um, it would be important work. And so um, we want to we wanna build a Florida that um, in the future views all children as precious mm. and believes that it's unconscionable for us to lock them away and arrest them and throw away the key. Mm. And um, there's, there's a lot of work that we have to examine in order to get there. And um, one of the more specific pieces I'll bring up, because it's, it's rare that I have the opportunity to be in front of a congregation of believers talking about our work. Um, you know, in order to get to a place where we do not allow the state to do the deplorable, inhumane things that it does when it gets its claws on our children. Um, we've got to really examine as believers what we believe um, is, the, is the thing that should happen when a harm has been committed. From a very young age, we teach our children that when you do something wrong, something bad is going to happen to you. Um, I remember when I was, when, and even now, when, you know, when we go out, you know, you go to a store and you see uh, a little white kid and they running around crazy and they just destroying things. <laughs> and and, 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 and y'all know what I'm going to say, look. So, and, then, and, then, and then their parents, they say, come here, Billy. <laughs> well, now, why are you doing that? And, and black people look at them and be like, that's why they doing that, because you... <laughs> You didn't smack the, the crap out of them. And we, and we laugh at that, but we've actually got to re-examine our notion 
of when a harm is committed, how we handle that. Because from a very young age, we see the belief that when a harm is done, when a wrong is done, that, that, that something painful, that some sort of punishment is going to come. It's a long-held social belief. Just not black people believe this. We all believe it. Crime comes with punishment. And so if we're going to reevaluate our conception of justice um, from a punitive place to a restorative place, right, where we don't banish that person, we don't send that person into the forest and say you're never allowed to be a part of our community again, then we'll never get to the country that we want to build. And so as, as, as believers, we've even got to reevaluate how we see it. Right. The, in the end of days, when you meet Jesus, we call it judgment day. Right. And so w when we when we know when something is done in the dark, it'll come to light. Right. The, even even the scripture. Right. We've got to examine it in a way and apply it in a praxis, in a practical way today that allows us to build a, a rehabilitative model around justice. One that doesn't um, send someone away, but brings the entire community together. And so that's the work that we've got to do to even get to a place where we're abolitionists. Mm. We don't believe that we need police. Mm. We don't believe that prisons are a means to finding justice in our communities and that this system will never give us justice. And so as, as my sister FM said, there has to be a new way. And the believers can be on the forefront mm. of building this new rehabilitative model of justice. Yes, 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 yes. FM, jump on in here because I know that you are in Chicago and they say, you know, the, you know, a lot of us don't get a chance to go to Chicago, but we see all of these weekly tallies of violence that are happening in Chicago. And you are someone, I met you in London uh, and we were at, uh, at the, the Transatlantic Roundtable for Race and Religion and uh, you were, you were, you know, emceeing and dropping hot tracks and, 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 and do it from an explicitly Christian place in, a, in an environment that is often very anti-Christian, whether in deeds or actions. And certainly all this violence we see, we hope it, we would categorize that as anti-Christian, but even in some of our movement spaces because of the harm the church has done, either intentionally or unintentionally, some folks aren't always comfortable. How do you show up? authentically as FM Supreme, as the, 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 the peacemaking, demon slaying, track dropping, freedom fighting warrior, and you had that beautiful smile and beautiful spirit. Tell, tell folks here, because there are a lot of folk in this congregation who actually are on the front lines doing a lot of different work. How has your faith kept you, right, and sustained you? And what would you want folks to know about Chicago that we won't see on the headlines? That's a great question, Pastor Mike. Um, well, just to be clear, I wasn't raised in a church. 28, uh, I was raised in foster care for four and a half years. And so when you're uh, from eight years old to 12 years old, which are like pivotal years of growth and development. And so having my foundations or like this instability, me and my brothers and sisters, I'm a middle child of five being split up, living with strangers, group homes, almost being adopted by a white family, going through all these different things, just like I, as far as like, Actually, it was the white family that taught me to pray before I eat, mm. you know. And so there are some things that are still with me from these experiences. And um, I wasn't really for sure if I, like, believed that God was real. Like, you know, we were told God is real, that Jesus is the Lord. But, you know, at 12 years, I remember we were at this, uh, I was in a different group, uh, foster home. And I was just, I couldn't stand there. And I was just like, when we was going to another court date, and I was like, and we was told every time we go to court, it would always be a continuance. But it was like we were supposed to be getting, my mom was supposed to get custody. And um, I just remember telling my foster mama, we called her Gammy. And I was like, Gammy, I ain't coming back here. We have an unsupervised visit this weekend. I'm going to my grandma house. And on Monday, we got court. And I'm not living here anymore. I'm about to be out the system. And so this is my man or whatever. And so I'm telling my other foster sisters and brothers the same thing. They're like, yeah, yeah, you ain't going nowhere. I'm like, I ain't coming back here. And so I prayed. I'm like, God, please let us go home. I don't want to live here anymore. And like, I'm tired. Like, we had this four and a half years, but as a child, a year is a long time. You know what I'm saying? And so um, we went, I went to my grandmother's house that weekend. We went to court Monday, and it continues, and I was just so mad. And I'm like, well, I guess, you know, not that there isn't a God, but I guess he didn't hear my prayer. But literally, it was Monday, 
But at my grandma, I stayed at my grandma's house two more days that Wednesday to judge, sign the papers, and get my mother full custody and my brothers and sisters. So that was when I'm like, okay, God is, God is real because I prayed about that. And I said I wasn't going back to get me house, and I didn't go back to get me house. So that made me, but, for, but as far as like as an adult, as a young adult, um, 2008, I had moved back to Chicago from New York City. I was interning at Warner Brothers Records. I had started college in New York in 06. And um, I had decided that I wanted to, to go back home and just like, make a name for myself and just do my thing. Had no interest in pursuing God, like at all. And I was a very like arrogant young lady, only arrogant out of insecurity and also after so many people tell you you're not nothing and then you become something. So you're like, you know, it's, you wear it on your sleeve, or at least I did. So long story short, I get back home to Chicago, oh wait, I'm humbled though. Like, yeah, I'm building a name in the community. I had already been known as a youth poet, uh, as an artist, as an activist. I've been active since 2004. Um, but battling homelessness, living with different friends, watching Obama become the first black president, seeing just success around me, but also not seeing any direction and where I was headed, I just prayed. And I went to the inauguration of the president in DC, January 09, and my best friend who's at Georgetown, University, um, he's from Karini Greens. And so to see God's grace in his life, and even though I was in foster care when we got out the system, my mom was always a hustler, so she sent us to private school. So, like, I always had a life that didn't really make sense. It's like you go to private school, but you ain't got no furniture in the crib, or you know what I'm saying? Just crazy <laughs> things like that. But hey, <laughs> education, right? And so, um, in Georgetown, my godmother's there, my best friend, they kind of they just look at me and they like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, what? They're like, you so talented, but you just, what are you doing with your life? I'm like, what you mean? I'm here at the inauguration of the first black president. Like, this is history. I wasn't gonna miss this for the world. Like, what you mean? They're like, but you ain't got no job. You're not in school right now. I'm like, I'm a rapper. Like, I'm not trying to work for anybody. I'm not trying to go to school, so I don't see what's the problem. Long story short, I could tell that they were sincerely, genuinely concerned about my well-being. And it, these are two people in my life who would just keep it unapologetically real with me. Like, when I don't even want to hear the truth. Like, they're like, boom. And so I went to New York. And I literally like broke down and like, God, I don't even know if you real, but if you real, if you real, Lord, I'm gonna need you to do help me with three things because I don't understand. I didn't did everything I was supposed to do. I, I, I graduated from high school when all the people around me from public school had dropped out. You know, my cousins who my age, y'all mamas and different things. And some people I grew up with dead. I didn't follow all these right things. I left school because of tuition, not because I didn't want to be a school guy. So, you know, my heart, you know, my path. If you are real, I need you to help me with three things. And these three, and I wrote it down. I'm like, in, in this order, this is what I need. <laughs> you gotta be specific sometimes, you know? And I'm like, I need a job. I need, I need a job, <laughs> a laptop, <laughs> and an apartment. No, it was job, apartment, laptop, in that order. <laughs> job, no, no, and, and this is why, and this is why, this is why. Because here's the thing, I was really buzzing, and so I was buzzing in Chicago as an MC. Nobody knew my personal struggles as FM Supreme. It was like I was grinding. And so I figured this. I said, okay, first of all, I need a job so I can take care of myself and pay for my apartment. But also, I need a job just to have an income because I can't be dependent on these shows to make money. Um, I need an apartment so I could be stable, so I can sit still and listen and wait for the whispers of the Holy Spirit versus being everywhere and trying to, Who's talking to me? Sit down and be still. And then the third thing was a laptop because I'm known already in the city and I'm grounded in the city. If I was put this grind on the internet, expand my brand that way and I could be able to work with what the bam. And so when I tell you God gave me those things in that order where you gotta work by faith, not by sight. Came back to Chicago, in a walk past the tea shop, talked to the manager, ended up getting hired at that tea shop. Two weeks later, Young Chicago Authors, a very prominent organization, they decided they want to hire me as talent manager. So I went from having no jobs to now I'm getting salary and working at this tea mm. shop. Now I'm starting to book gigs again. Now I'm booking stuff for Youth Speaks, Brave New Voices, which is based here in Oakland. It was God. Then I went overseas to England. And so long story short, it was those defining moments for me. And then when I go, when I get to Amsterdam and London, I don't mean to, I'm just testifying real quick. So when I get to Amsterdam in August, in August 2009, I'm like, this is nothing but God. Right. I was homeless this year. Mm. How the heck am I overseas performing? Mm. They treat me like a star. They mm. rolling things out. And I'm from Chicago. This don't make no sense. And so it humbled me to the fact when I came back home from Europe, I decided not to curse in my music anymore. I knew it was sacred. This is spiritual what God is doing because how is this opening up doors? Mm. And so that's in a nutshell. Woo! So, yeah. so my truth, music, yeah. so I can't. And the reason how am I able to authentically ask your question, to authentically be myself is because, as I was telling Umi and the other Dream Defenders when we were having this conversation, I cannot 
come to a space and be like myself and be like, oh, whatever, whatever, without acknowledging what gave me that confidence, what it gave me that, what got me out of when I was crying in my room, you know what I'm saying, when I'm hurt. Like, abolish the police? I got thousands of hate from that. Mm. Stupid nigger, female dog, constantly. Mm. So like, and that was, and then there was a lot of people in the movement and outside the movement who wasn't for sure if they wanted to stand next to me. So for me, it was like, God, all I got is you, help me, Lord. Mm. You with me, told me what to do. How do I move forward from mm. this? And he moved. So mm. I gotta be, I don't care about how people feel about God. I mean, I hope people love God. I do, and I'm, I don't try to push my beliefs off on people, but I'm not going to hide my beliefs right. or be ashamed of my Woo, beliefs, yeah. period. Yeah. Woo! FM! FM! My God, today. All right, Rahel, bring us on home. Uh, you, 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 uh, you, you are, she is a world-renowned person and she could she could preach and she's preached all over the place so uh, we don't have her come back and preach uh one one day but i i i i want you to uh because we talk a lot about toxic masculinity and and issues of women's justice and all these different kind of things and you're a trained theologian from yale divinity school um graduated from stanford uh former journalist of washington post so you somebody praise god you 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 smart and you you, you. <laughs> So I would love for you, just real quick, or not, you just take how much time you want, but t talk a little bit about, about why the church needs to address these issues of, of uh, the invisibility of women or the burden that women carry, uh, toxic masculinity. As a theologian and as a preacher, why do you think this is such an important thing? And, and what would you say uh, to our congregation that's kind of leaning into this um, at this moment in time? Um, so first I'm laughing because I think Claudia and Umi are rejoicing in this moment um, because I had the opportunity to ask them a bunch of questions that they weren't prepared for. So they're like, now it's your turn. <laughs> um, so, so thank you, Pastor. Hey, who, but, um, we're friends. <laughs> but, okay, so the first thought that I had uh, was Hagar. My mind immediately went to Hagar. My heart started beating when I thought about Hagar. Um, I always go back to this woman of color, you know, who's really trying to figure out how to take care of her child amidst a home um, that was using her but not loving on her, right? And trying to figure out her relationship to God amidst oppression and invisibility and trying to provide for a child with limited resources and living in a home with a privileged uh, Jewish woman by the name of Sarah and really probably trying to wrestle with the question of, of does God see me? <laughs> and does God know my pain and my struggle? Which I think is a question that we as women probably ask ourselves every single day. And so I always remember when she finally says, for I have seen the face of God and live to tell about it. And so um, independent of what the church says about women, I think women on a very personal level can say, for I have seen the face of God and live to tell about it, yeah. right? And we, mm. don't, we don't need the church to affirm that for us, mm. ever. We have our conversations with God. We look into the eyes of God. We cry on the shoulder of God. Mm. God holds our hands when people abandon us. Mm. God puts money in our pocket when there are no resources. And God listens to us when everyone else says we have no voice. Mm. I'm emotional because there's nothing in the world I love more than God. There's nothing that has given me more purpose, more power than my relationship with God. And so the last thing in the world that I ever look for is someone to validate my connection to God. Mm. Mm. So, I have never looked to the church to tell me if I have a space on a pulpit. Mm. I have gone to the pulpit unwillingly, dragging my feet because this is the last place I want to be. Even when Pastor Mike called me, I did not want to come here because this is the space I am least comfortable. But I am here because this is where God calls me, mm. right? 
This is the assignment that so many of us walk in. And so it is so good that we can hear God without conduits and intercessories, because if we listen to men, we would get the wrong message. Right? Touch your name. So, and I say that, I'm sorry, you got me started, but let me, let me, let me. <laughs> But, and I say that because when I've thought about the men, and I will say men of faith even, who have spoken into my life, sometimes they pray for me, they held my hand, they saw something in me, but the next minute they talk about how I look and how I dress, right? I've had men who were spiritual fathers and married come on to me, right? And I'm saying that to you because you have to draw a distinction between your maker and the men in your life, Come on. right? Come on. You have to. Mm. Speaking of toxic masculinity, mm. it is rarely our relationship with Jesus that we have a problem with. It is rarely God. It is always man. Mm. Always. And I personally will say my relationship with God was tarnished my whole entire life. I did not love and come to know God until I was 21 years old because so many people had done damage to the image of God in my life. That by the time I had a chance to even know who God was, I had to undo what people had done to God, right? And so separating who man is and who God is will be one of the most liberating things that we will ever do for ourselves, right? One of the things that I learned is that God is not a God of punishment. God is not a God of control. God is a God of love, right? And learning what unconditional love means, a love that is not based on gratification, a love that is not based on what you have to give, but it's based on you simply being. That all you got to do is just be. I think that alone is one of the hardest things for women to accept, that you don't have to do anything, but just be. You don't have to get a degree. I happen to, but that's not where my worth comes from. Mm. It's intrinsic. Mm -hmm. Can't nobody take it away. I lost positions, I lost titles, but can't nothing in the world take the value that God has given me. So, in conclusion, I am not invisible and none of us are. Why? I go back to Hagar because God has seen us, right? So whether we are ever in the newspapers, mm -hmm. on television, whether they ever quote us, maybe we started it, but a man got credit for it, oh. right? <laughs> maybe we let it, but we were, the, we were the fine print instead of the headline. Regardless of that, if you believe that you are seen and have been seen before you were ever even born, there is no such thing as invisibility or silencing. Mm. Woo. Woo, woo, woo. These my friends, y'all. I got some good friends. I got some good friends. P come on, everybody. Let's appreciate Rahel, Umi, FM, Antonio. And let's stretch our right hand forward and let's bless them real quick. God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you for our loved ones who came and shared with us uh, the significance not only of this weekend and the work we do in the world, but your calling to us as your people. I pray that you'll fill them up with all the goodness and grace and strength and favor that is required to fulfill their divine assignments. Thank you for the gift they've dropped in this house today. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Clap it.